Outback Stories. Outback Stories celebrates the pioneering spirit of Australia. It makes little difference if your family came on the first fleet or on a leaky boat last week. Our unique national identity was born and bred in the outback. These are your stories. The image of the weathered swagman, bedroll strapped across his back, battered bush hat pulled defiantly onto his head as he determinedly tramps along a country road to nowhere in particular is firmly printed into the Australian psyche. It is a colourful image, no doubt reinforced by Australia's unofficial national anthem, Banjo Patterson's Waltzing Matilda. The reality of the swag carrying brigade, especially in the latter part of the 19th century and the long years of the Great Depression, is far more brutal. With most wanderers, because of economic misfortune, forced to tramp in order to exist. The swaggy could always rid himself of thoughts of politics and home comforts and regular money and comfortable clothing and even comradeship. But he was continually faced with the immediate problem of finding something to eat. Now without Tucker, the body doesn't function, let alone carry a leg to the next town. Australian Swaggies, the name coming directly from the fact that they carried their belongings as a swag, were also known as bagmen, tramps, whalers and sundowners. They were acknowledged as amongst the most original and curious wanderers on earth. Maybe it was the sheer size of the country, the harshness of the outback, the relative youthfulness of European settlement, but our pioneers had to look at every obstacle and how to overcome it. It was a challenge and one that they were usually prepared for. There was also the fact that between 1870 and 1900, many itinerant workers, especially shearers, drovers and other seasonal workers, walked in their pursuit of work. They travelled on Shank's Pony. First Australian were age-old, experienced wanderers and with their inherent knowledge of the bush and its ways, probably better suited to treading the same pathways. They certainly knew about bush medicine, native food and where to find water. Australia's boom economic ride of the 19th century came to an abrupt halt in the 1890s when Australia became part of a global depression and, at the same time, experienced the collapse of the wool market, our main industry, and the effects of a crippling drought. Labour problems, especially in the shearing industry, also sent the economy sideways. These were tough times. Many pastoralists had no choice but to walk off their property and leave it to the crows. Humping your drum, or tramping the wallaby track, walking from town to town, looking for work, was a matter of survival. The 1890s depression hit deeper and lasted longer in Australia than any other country. 
Oh, together we'll roam from our drought-stricken home. It's tough that such things have to be. And it's hard on a horse if he's not for a boss, but a broken-down squatter like me. The world's economy soured again in the early 1930s as the Great Depression toppled capitalism. Banks closed and industry folded, once again sending men and also women out as swaggies. Homelessness combined with a government-supported sustenance payment scheme where men had to tramp from town to town looking for work and mostly finding none, to receive a stamp in their ration book entitling them to collect food coupons. Tramping with a swag had to be done right. The blanket roll, or drum, had to be rolled correctly and strung across the back to avoid back injuries. Most swaggies also carried another wrap slung around their neck containing their water can, billy and other possessions. Some soap, matches, spare socks and whatever rations they had saved. Usually tea, sugar, salt and some flour. Some carried photographs of loved ones, a notebook, and possibly a much-admired book. Plugs of tobacco were almost a currency, as nearly everyone smoked. Flies were the curse of the tramping swagman or woman. To travel without a fly net or corks hanging from your hat was nigh impossible, The flies tormented the travellers as they crawled into every orifice. Drinking tea and eating was impossible without swishing the buggers away. The billy was the traveller's most important possession, and tea saw many the traveller, down on luck, receive some comfort knowing hope came with a mug of tea after a day's tramp. Old wet tea leaves were saved. If you couldn't reuse them, then they were useful to suck if the day was hot and dry and water scarce. Most station owners and cooks were sympathetic to the travellers and when possible would give them a handout. If a station was known for refusing ration handouts, we would often leave a sign, a code mark near the gate, to let other travellers know not to bother. Others were known for their generosity. In July 1931, the West Australian newspaper reported how a retired farmer, John Gray, had bequeathed £4,000, an enormous sum, to be held in trust for the provision of food and lodging for swagmen passing through his district. Humour on the track was an important part of survival, the general attitude being, if you can't laugh at the ridiculousness of your situation, what else can you do? Swaggy humour seems endless. When asked where they were sleeping, they would likely say, The Moon and Stars Hotel, ground floor. Yeah, we took our meals in the grand rustic room of the hotel universe. In order to avoid starvation, cadging food became an art. Bart Saggers a swagman during the 1930s depression, told of professional swaggies who could even cadge rations out of fellow swaggies. He jokingly referred to himself as a Rhodes Scholar. At Allera, 
I met my first professional swagman. His name was Tommy the Count, and he told me he was a bagman. Well, I'll tell you how he got his name. He'd use words like, excuse me, and pardon me, and my good man, all the words that swagmen never use. He'd actually bluff people. And by this skill, he, he lived off the cuff. He'd even touch other swagmen, and that was unusual. There was a real art in cadging a feed. I've met swagmen who could cadge tucker out of an empty tucker bag. They were that persuasive. I'm giving you the gun. Some swaggies earned a little extra money by plaiting greenhide whips, bridles, halters, belts and hat bands to sell to stockmen and drovers. Others made water bags out of old canvas, using the necks of bottles for mouthpieces, or did wood carving, making stock whip handles and needlewood smoking pipes. The swagman lived off his wits, and although he usually looked on his fellow travellers as equals, he certainly showed a great deal of respect and admiration for those who had battled the ranks to be elevated to the position of a professional swagman. The professional swagman had to serve an apprenticeship, learn off his mates, absorb the code of ethics. He'd have to be downright clever, outsmart everybody and outcadge anyone he met, be they storekeeper, policeman or fellow swagman. There were, of course, swagmen who were up to all sorts of tricks to cadge food. Most grocery stores banned them from entering their shops for fear they'd purposely knock over a display of canned goods and apologetically gather them up again, all the time apologising and slipping a few cans into their coats. It was expected that station owners would give rations to travellers in exchange for some light work, like chopping wood, sweeping the verandas, collecting eggs from the chook house. It was a two-way street, and most seemed pretty happy with this sort of arrangement. We asked a lady the other day for something for to eat A little piece of chicken or a little piece of meat A little bit of turkey or a little bit of ham Half a dozen loaves of bread and a bucket full of jam The exception was a particular type of swaggy called the sundowner. Arriving as the daylight disappeared, he'd complain it was too dark to do any work. Station owners soon got the idea and would usually send them on their way without rations. There's a species of tramp found nowhere but in Australia that spends its whole life travelling from station to station, getting a night's lodging and rations, uh, well, that's a measure of flour, tea and sugar. From his invariable habit of making his appearance just before the sun sets, his personage has got the name Sundowner by which he is universally known. Station owners tended to be cautious with aggressive swagmen, fearing a refusal of rations could result in some damage to the station property and worse, a mysterious fire. In the 1890s, several shearing sheds were burned to the ground by the swagman's friend, Bryant and May, the popular brand of matches. Indeed, there is some thought that Banjo Patterson was inspired to write Waltzing Matilda after hearing of an itinerant who might just have been murdered after a local shearing shed mysteriously burned down. The lean and mean economic times were eventually followed by a return to economic normality. The first decade of the 20th century heralded a new, more progressive nation that celebrated its federation of colonies in 1901 and a population shift that, 
for the first time, saw more people living in the cities and near the coast. Australia had also benefited from success in the wheat industry, beef and gold and silver mining in the country's west. The following decade was rightfully called the Roaring Twenties, as we boomed again. After the Great Depression of the 1930s and the lean times of World War II, we finally started to relax in the 1950s. Aided by a measured population explosion led by immigration, the country was back on track. <laughs>